So over the course of the week, what I've been taken and shown again and again, what I've experienced myself is this overwhelming sense of disenfranchisement. It's something that I is afflicting all of us. We're all in states of quarantine, in states of chaos, as life has been made exponentially more difficult, either by either by the attempts to control this disease or by attempts to control how we act in the midst of this disease, how by the various attempts to make things better, they in some ways make things worse. And while you can argue the, the virtues of that, it doesn't really matter because they are in place and they are what's happening. Even if we don't like it, And while the, while the road is lined with good intentions, it oftentimes can be hell for most of us. And that's a reality that we've all been enduring, all been facing, and it's left a lot of us in states of minor decay, as life is not what we want it to be. It's not where we want it to be. It's not how we want to live. And fear is an ever-present thing that's just pressing down on us all the time. So we do what everybody does, and we try to take control. Humanity has this uh, incredible penchant for not responding well to feeling out of control. It leads to a greater chaos. We don't, we don't face a loss of control with grace. We, sit, we face it with indignity and selfishness and callousness we become reckless even the most gallant of souls will oftentimes falter in the face of having no control and even their gallantry can become circumstantial in that it will adjust and conform to something where they can justify doing some of the worst things in order to try to make themselves feel better, to feel validated, to feel righteous, to feel good. There's a line out of Job that oftentimes comes to mind in the face of these things. And it's when Elihu comes up and he's speaking to Job and he sent something to the effect of do not sin in your discomfort. Or rather, yeah, do not sin in your discomfort, which you seem to prefer to discomfort. I'll look it up. It's always funny. I always remember this verse. 
and can never ever find it easily. Beware of turning to evil, which you seem to prefer to affliction. It's Job 36, verse 21. Okay. I could read the whole thing, honestly, because Elihu, in Job, he talks so much about our responses to affliction as he's effectively grilling Job over Job's frustrations. A lot of people misinterpret the book of Job. They, it's a long book. It's a long book of the Bible. It's 40, 40 plus chapters and they're long chapters. So it's not, a, it's not a fault of anybody who reads it. But most people remember the beginning lines of it. They talk about how Job was a righteous man before the Lord and how even in the face of losing everything, he simply says, well, naked I came into this earth and naked I shall leave, as though it's no big deal. A lot of people forget that that's the first chapter. There's 40. Job suffers a long, there's a lot of suffering in between that Job goes through. And by chapter 30, by the 30s, he's not, in that same mindset. Instead, he's sitting there condemning, frustrated at God for everything that he's gone through. Now, I've talked about this before, but we'll, we'll so we'll, we'll get to that near the end. Because it's important for us to understand, like disenfranchisement, Job's a great example of somebody disenfranchised. He was an honored man who lost everything. It was all taken away from him. He was left destitute, covered in boils, miserable, and he had only God to blame in his mind. And from his perspective, that's where he sat. And that's where we always sit. Every, every Christian, every follower of Jesus, everybody who believes, we all run into the same specific problem, which is that we, we suffer. We live on this earth and we suffer. And when we suffer, we ask God, why? Why do you allow this? Why do you let us endure this? Why do you watch idly by? Or why do you watch idly and let this all pass by? And the thing with God is that like, we're, we're told to believe all these things about how he's the hero in this story. The Bible is the story of God's coming to rule and reclaim and save his bride. God, God is the, <laughs> he's, he's the Superman to our lowest lane. He's always going to come and save us until we're suffering. He he created everything. He sees all of time and existence. He stands outside of so many dimensions, and yet we suffer. We go through all this pain, and we have, and we're left to endure it. And we we don't know why. We're, there's so much fear and anxiety and doubt and frustration, and he's silent. And that's hard. It's hard to continue to believe in somebody who's not there when you know they can be. 
we we believe that God is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. He knows everything. He's always around. He sees everything. And yet, it feels like he's so far away so many times. And we live in this state of wondering why. And in that state, we come up with really bizarre conclusions, twisted ver interpretations of the scripture. I've spent uh, the last couple of weeks kind of ragging on the church in a way about how we don't, a lot of Christians have the title but not the faith or belief. And the truth of the matter is, is that we, as a lot of that comes from this circumstance that we're talking about right now. Because disenfranchisement has always been a big part of being a Christian. Like, a lot of people don't understand the kind of historical context, so I'll kind of lay it out in a way. But Christianity, as it, in, like in America, we see Christianity as like the oppressive aspect, the oppressive religion that has dictated so much of the course of our existence. Because, you know, for years there was kind of this dictated, mandated, aspect of life that you go to church on Sunday and you be there and everybody had to believe in God and everybody had to have their Bible and everybody had to be a Christian. It was the social, it was the social norm. And a lot of people think that that was really great, that that was the best way for us to be, but it was never real. As a result, we have spent all this time developing a culture in our in our religion as it were of kind of a godless status quo where we don't really we don't look to god for things we really we pray and then we think of what we can do to make things better i always think of a line in a song that talks about how how our faith has been hurt by the constant like the constant need for us to have things come come to us immediately and that's how we are we don't have the ability we don't understand the concepts of meekness and long suffering so we we get we get stressed out very quickly when things aren't immediately going better. And that's not a that's not a critique. That's a statement of fact, speaking from both experience and observation. So we, we sit in, these discom in this discomfort, wondering when God is going to show up and when he's going to save us, and it maybe doesn't happen. Maybe he doesn't save us in the way that we want or we think it needs to happen. Maybe he doesn't provide the way out, or maybe the way out is available the entire time and we just don't see it. But either way, you know, in the end you can only be you can only be accountable for the things that you see, right? If you can't get out of your head and step back and see the opportunity that you have to get away from this destructive, painful situation that you're in where you feel powerless and hopeless and lost and like you need to be saved, you don't see the exit. All you see is what's happening. And the truth of the matter is, is where a lot of us sit it's very loud. It's almost like, like a lot of us, we kind of sit in this place where our anxiety, our fears, our doubts are just loud in our ears. It's almost like a, like a buzzing. It's distracting. It's hard to think beyond that. Or we're angry and frustrated. And there are so many emotions kind of boiling to the surface and underneath all of it, just pushing and pulling 
us in different ways and we we don't know what to do with that you you need to take control somehow but you can't you can't control that so you control other things and we don't see what we're doing so we we create situations like we might lose our identities and try to create new identities we might try to find new jobs we might try to find new distractions we might cope in some mundane or horrible ways you know anywhere from things like distractions like tv shows and video games and things like that as we binge those to take our minds off of everything and that's not to say that that's bad it's simply to say sometimes we do these things to cope and sometimes we do too much of it to cope or we we delve into like substances drugs and alcohol or a fine escape that a lot of people use that have dire consequences or can have dire consequences so we we do all these things just to escape and try to like take control of our own emotions or how we feel or we try to like create a new identity for ourselves as being like a hero i see a lot of people fighting online and there's so much virtue signaling and just I mean it's all it's all kind of bullshit simply put because nobody's really addressing what's going on in their own hearts everyone's kind of outwardly focused and trying to fix the world around them but not understanding that in these kinds of planes that's not going to change anything like disenfranchisement has been a growing part of being an american for the last 10 plus years it's got been going on longer i mean i can think back to being a to growing up on a farm in minnesota you know that my aunt and uncle well uncle at the time ran and how they were constantly having to fend off like government and major com government funded companies who were trying to move in and buy their land to run and take over their dairy farm. This has been an ongoing thing as like more and more power has shifted from the hands of the people into like a centralized form. And the byproduct of centralized government is it diminishes the power and the freedoms of its people. And a lot of us, like, we think that that sounds good until we're affected by it, at which point we realize that it's not good. It's terrible, in fact. But for most of us, for most people, we're not good at being compassionate or empathetic, actually. Americans in general have, like, a savior complex, but empathy is not a strong suit for us. We can see a problem that is bad and we can rush in to fix it. That's kind of been part of our cultural identity for a long time. But when it comes down to feeling what the other people are feeling and being able to stop and sit with them in it, that is not, that's not what we do. We're not good at that. Not in general, at least. we so we we struggle with this whole thing and in the end we we're kind of stuck in this place of loss where we're we're trying to do good things but that's really just a cover for the fact that we're not feeling like we can do much. And our world's kind of on fire around us and we don't have control over it. How do we endure that? And where is God? I mean, we just did like several messages talking about the need to like lean on God and move towards God and trust in God. 
But how do we do that in the face of all of this mess? Everything being so wrong and off and gross. Well, it's not easy. The hardest thing about it is knowing that we have this all-powerful being who's capable of changing the whole world as we see it. He can take it and flip it on its own axis, but he doesn't. And we don't understand why. And see, again, in order to understand God, it's not easy. And there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of unpacking that has to go into this, the disenfranchisement and the response to it that we all kind of endure. The first thing that I want us to think about, or to look at, is God's own nature and his own character. One of the things that we oftentimes fail to understand is exactly how valuable choice is. Because, see, the thing about it is, is that choice is a requirement for us to exist as we are. A lot of people don't appreciate will. Predest the entire five-point Calvinist doctrine of predestination completely dissolves the concept of free will. As we're kind of wedged into this pedantic version of life. But where you either are or you aren't. And God knew from the beginning, therefore it's going to happen. And it's, that's not true, per se. You're basically taking the words of Paul and twisting them in a way that actually conflicts with words of Jesus. As he talks about the desire of God to, fr to save the whole world. The thing that we, we have to consider is that for God, choice is of an utmost important thing. Because love is only exists with where choice exists. So, God, and you need to understand as well that every living creature has choice to some extent. We oftentimes, I'm like, someone I like, argue with things about like biology, where, you know, bees don't have a choice, only the queen mates, and that's not true. Oftentimes, the worker, the workers who are all female will mate with the drones, and they'll actually like tuck their own eggs into the honeycomb, into the comb sometime. <laughs> like, there's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of other stuff going on biologically at any point in time than a lot of us are aware of. We understand stereotypes. And that's a dangerous ground for us, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Because that's important for the whole disenfranchisement discussion and in terms of what we feel on a regular basis. Right now, to talk about God, we need to understand that everything has choices, especially when it revolves around like the spiritual. Every angel has a decision of whether to follow God or not. And this is something that was made clear by the fall of Satan. Satan chose to turn his back on God. He chose to live the to be the way he is. The same with the third of the angels that fell with him. They all made the decision to follow him. Just as the other angels chose to stay with God. We, we have a lot of weird ideas about angels as though they don't have the ability, the ability to make choices. I don't know why we believe that. I don't know. There's nothing in the Bible to allude to that. There's nothing in anything to really grant us that as a fact. But we believe that. The truth is, is that choice is imperative. Even in the midst of heaven... Have you ever considered that what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, at the end, when he talks about love, 
he says that the, the three things that will remain in everything are faith, love, and hope. Oftentimes we interpret the idea of heaven as being the perfect place, that there is nothing that can go wrong then. But why, So why would hope be something that remains after, after we stand in perfection? Why would faith be important? Why would we need to have faith when God's standing in front of us? When we're a part of his kingdom, when he's so clearly there? Why would we have to hope when God is clearly there and he's got our, we can see him? Well, because at any point in time we could make the choice to turn on him again. Being in perfection does not mean that we've re been removed from our ability to decide what we want to do. We were created with this. It's why we decided to eat of the fruit that brought death into this world. We stood in perfection at one time, and we chose to disregard it in order to have something that we thought we wanted. So understanding that choice is a big part of our existence is important for us to understand why God doesn't step in the way he does, or the way we want him to. There are a lot of situations that we put ourselves in. There are a lot of decisions that we make and the ripples of those decisions. And what's more is there are a lot of decisions that other people make too. We have this kind of, uh, I don't know if it's entirely just our culture, but one thing that I have been shown time and time again, one thing that has been seen time and time again is we're very selfish. And I don't mean, mean it in the typical sense. I mean that we are very egocentric as people we tend to look at the world as a story around us and we're the we're the hero our story is about us our everything in the world everyone around us is just a byproduct a, a secondary character as we move about our day but what we fail to understand is that this is a living world and it's not just about us our world is dictated by a lot of other people's choices the things that they choose to do and choose not to do. So your disenfranchisement, your feelings of powerlessness and hopelessness could easily come as a result of somebody else making decisions and you have no power, no control to fix that because it was all in their hands. When, when Donald Trump was elected president and everyone rioted about that, their riots were meaningless. They did not have the power to change what had happened. He was president and that was all. No matter how much traffic they blocked, no matter how much they protested, he was the president and that was going to remain the case. No matter how angry they got and the, and the reality of that was crippling. To face the reality that this person was now their president and they didn't want them was very difficult to take and that's understandable because a lot of people were affected very poorly as a result. And this has been a constant thing. And I use this example just as one that we can all remember and kind of gravitate towards to say. And there are plenty of other examples out there. Even with this election, when Biden became president, Trump fought desperately to keep it. Constant recounts, different things, but it was beyond his control because people showed up and voted him out of office. Just as his the people who followed him fought desperately to believe that he was actually the one going to stay in power that was never going to happen he lost the choices were made it was over we struggle with this all the time this feeling of powerlessness it's, it's an aspect of being a human being and the choices of ourselves and the choices of others. And sometimes we make decisions that we don't understand the ramifications of. So we will think that we will hitch ourselves to a wagon and think that this is going to be great and it's going to make the world a better place. And then it happens and we rejoice. 
until the full effects of it start to be seen and we realize that we made a mistake. Examples of this exist all throughout our history. We, we as human beings, have always done this. See, we wanted to be gods. We still want to be gods. Say, the, the serpent's lie to Adam and Eve, which wasn't necessarily a lie. But his deceit was, surely you'll become like him. You will not die, but you'll become like God. And that, that was a temptation that they would not give up on. And we have never given up on that temptation. We have had kings who desperately believed that they were gods. The pharaohs believed they were gods. Xerxes whipped the ocean for, for being disobedient when it wrecked his ships during, when a storm came up and wrecked his ships when he was trying to invade Greece. It doesn't change either. Uh, the richest and most powerful of our people, of, um, of people still do this kind of stuff. They believe this kind of, these kinds of things. Eugenics was incredibly important in, uh, man, in the early 1900s, late 1800s. Elitist societies believed in the idea of proper breeding and that it was a good idea that the best stock of humans was what needed to be bred. Honestly, it's part of why evolution became such a popular thing so early on. They grabbed onto that because they were just like, yeah, this fits right along with us. Evolution, survival of the fittest, eugenics, they all go hand in hand. Or did, anyways. But we, we are constantly trying to control every aspect of our existence we we always want to put ourselves in the seat of god and then we suffer and we wonder why god isn't saving us a lot of the message the verses that i got for this message were out of psalms And there's a reason for that. Because Psalms, the Psalms have a tendency to be very real, very raw. We'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more in depth in just a moment. But just for now, one of the Psalms I was given was Psalms 53. And when I got it, I had no idea that we were going here. So here we are just a little blurb from the director of music according to uh, Mahaloth a masculine of David I don't know what any of those words mean I'll be honest with you verse 1 the fool says in his heart there is no God they are corrupt and their ways are vile there is no one who does good God looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. Everyone has turned away. All have been become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all these evil do doers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. They never call on God. But there they are, overwhelmed with dread, where there was nothing to dread. God scattered the bones of those who attacked you. You put them to shame, for God despised them. Oh, what's, oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When God restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and all Israel be glad. This isn't new. None of this is new. These psalms were written, this one was written in the time of David, ages ago. 
it's prior to the Babylonian, the Second Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar. It's parallel with the Egyptian pharaohs. We have we have constantly struggled with this thing where we we do not lean on God, we do not look for Him, we look for ourselves. Our faith in God is in that is for many Christians our faith in God is not in God but in that he will make us right when we do the things that we choose to do in that we put ourselves in the place of God by saying this is what I will do this is how I will react to this this is my way of doing it God be with me We don't look to God for direction or help, not really. We look for him to back us up when we do the things that we choose to do. We look for God to be the secondary player in our story, for him to be the power behind our decisions, our actions. And as a result, we find ourselves in place, and then when we find ourselves in places where we have no power, we have no control, we feel lost and helpless and we wonder where God is. He's supposed to be making everything work for us. But that's not true. That little history lesson to be for brevity's sake. Again, we understand, we in America understand Christianity as being like the major religion that once ruled our country. And ruled Europe before that as the, as the Catholic Church uh, the Pope was a very, very powerful figure in European history in terms of politics. But for the rest of the world, that's never been the case. What's more is, prior to all of that, Christianity was, a, was the, one of those religions that was just persecuted to hell. We read stories about Nero, Emperor of Rome, using Christians as street lamps. He'd crucify them and burn their bodies on the streets of Rome as lamps for the people in the city. They'd gather up Christians and throw them into the, uh, into the arenas to be eaten by lions and tigers and bears as a halftime show. They wouldn't arm them. They couldn't fight back. They just got eaten by wild predators who were hungry. This was the beginning of our faith. Like, this is how Christianity spread. Christianity, unlike most war major religions, Christianity did not spread by a war. Like, contrary to popular belief, Christianity didn't spread with the Crusades. The places that the Crusaders went had already had Christianity. On the contrary, Christianity spread by the blood of its people. In the beginning, when, when it first began to spread, you know, after the books of Acts, after the stories told of Paul and everyone, I mean, most of the, most of the apostles were killed. They were executed. I seem to recall the story of Bartholomew being that he was, the tradition holds that Bartholomew was, he was crucified upside down. Or, and burned at the stake as well, or something like that. It was just, it was way over the top. I believe it was James, who was also crucified upside down. Like, they, they did this stuff. They tortured us. Why do you think Jesus sat there? Like, it, it was always disingenuous to me, growing up in the Midwest, to sit in a church and have somebody talk to me about, have some pastor who was effectively like one of the most important people in town in these small Midwestern towns, talk about the abuses of Christians. And I think it's been disingenuous for a lot of people especially in the secular realm, as 
Christians being a a majority in terms of faith then proceed to talk about persecution and they'll read quotes from Jesus in like John 16 where he talks about how the world hated you because it hates you because it hates me first and they turn around and in the most self-righteous ways and judgmental ways they appropriate that in order to make themselves the victim as they proceed to start wars with every other element of society and then they then when society turns around and fights back and they find themselves hopelessly outmatched they then get mad at god for not backing them or they pretend they're not Uh, truth be told is that a lot of the past like 50 plus years Christianity's been like that guy that shows up to the bar calls everyone trash and then acts like a victim when somebody beats the hell out of him it's been the way we've been it's been wrong the whole time we've uh we've created the circumstances for our own our own suffering in those cases because we chose to use the gospel we chose to use God as a means of judging the world around us instead of loving and fulfilling the world around us because we wanted to be the God but of course for the secular world they do the same thing Especially now, like there are a lot of people who look at Christianity and say, well, now you're getting your comeuppance because we're doing the same things to you. <laughs> we're so good. It's all delusional because it, it's only continuing the same cycles of foolishness and disenfranchisement and, and hate and suffering. It's just, it's just a spinning wheel. And even like a lot of, I've had a lot of, I've seen a lot of things about like cancel culture now. People talking about cancel culture and how it's funny that Christians spent all that time trying to cancel everything. Like Marilyn Manson, for example. Who they ended up being right about. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they spent all this time like you know, condemning society and judging society and now society is coming back at them and they're just doing the same thing. And for whatever reason, like, they think that that's going to be better if they do it now. It's not. See, Christianity back in the day in, of Rome was viewed as like a, it was a, a crime to be a Christian. So Christians were huddled in little, like, secret meeting places Kind of like what they do in China now. Where it was illegal for them to gather and be Christians together. To talk about Jesus. To have relationships with Jesus. You could be murdered for that. You could be executed. It was a capital offense to put any god above Caesar. And they did. And they got executed. I always remember the story of Polycarp. He was one of the old church fathers who was burned at the stake multiple times because God wouldn't let him die he would there was a story of him being tied to the stake and lit on fire and it didn't burn they had to try it a couple of times if I remember right they finally just decapitated him But the thing about all of this is, is that that's where we come from. That was, that's how Christianity came to be. It wasn't glorious and triumphant. It was a lot of suffering and dying and people saw something that people were willing to suffer and die for. Because the people who were suffering and dying had a real relationship with Jesus. And that's where we get into the subject of how we overcome these feelings of disenfranchisement. We wonder why God's not there, but if we understand that so much of the world around us revolves around choice, 
choices of ourselves, choices of others, and the way that that can affect us and how that's part of living. That's where we can find that there's a place for us to lean on God, to draw close to him, to be one with him, to understand him. And suffering is something that he does as well. Jesus was meek. Jesus was long-suffering. Jesus endured a lot of terrible stuff. The constant fight with the Pharisees, the, the constant uh, dismissal by his own like family and people who knew him growing up. He was, he was a man who went through a lot, going out to the desert, being tempted by the enemy. But he also held the perspective of God and just the value of these people in Israel. The first thing he did upon seeing Jerusalem was he wept. And he cried out for the city that what it was meant to be. But had become something else. Like... For all of us, there's this place where we're meant to draw close and be one with God. And in that oneness, we can feel with him. And the grim reality is, is that as he suffers, we will suffer too. God does suffer. He suffers at the, in response to the pain of his people, his children who are going through everything that they're going through, but also bringing so much of it on themselves but also just to see what the world is becoming around them and how it's turning on them, how it's turning on us. We're not alone. We're not destitute. In the end, we win. We'll always win. But getting to victory is not always, is not always a triumphant thing. We're raised on stories of wars and battles and how that glorious they are until we get there and we find out what it feels like to be scared for our lives, to be hurt, to suffer, to endure, and to have to embrace the suck and continue moving forward. This is the cost of us wanting to be gods. It's a world that is broken. It's a bro world that will never be completely whole until it's redone. And until that happens, the suffering, the pain, we will continue to have to endure it from time to time. Our governments are not structures that God sent down from heaven for us to be, to belong to. They're things that we made up and now we live under the, under the weight of. Our societies are not things that God created and crafted in his image and in the image of his cult, of his kingdom. They're groupings of people who came up with ideas for how life should be and then proceeded to make those so. We suffer in the midst of those things. None of this has to do with God. Everything in it has to do with us and our attempts to control and make things better. We think that if we change things, it will be better. We think that if things stay the same, it will be better. And we fight about this constantly. The traditionalists versus the progressives. And we're constantly at odds with each other because we don't, we don't know the actual answer. We just know that something's wrong. And that and that somehow it might get better. Maybe if we stay right where we're at, it's going to get better. Or maybe if it, maybe you're good right where it's at and you're comfortable, but everyone else wants change. So you're saying, no, you're going to screw me over. Or maybe you're, you're suffering and you need a change, so you're going to try to break out and make things different. You, there has to be a way. But the thing about change... The thing about making decisions like that is that we don't always we don't always have the perspective. Again, that feeling of disenfranchisement, that pain, 
of that, it's crippling. Like I, I'll go back to that point. It's loud in our ears where it oftentimes deafens us and blinds us. There's no clarity. We need clarity, but we don't have it. Yeah. We're three-dimensional beings on a three-dimensional plane, and we're suffering effects of that plane, and it's not in our control. And as we grasp for ways to control it, oftentimes we'll grab for the first thing that seems logical, and that may not be good. Just whatever will relieve our suffering for a moment. And as a result, we, we suffer more later. But that's not where God would have us be. Trusting in him, knowing that he's there, being in a relationship with him means having the opportunity to be released from that, to know you're going to be okay. And that's not always enough. I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes knowing that you're going to be okay is not enough to compensate for not being okay right now. Sometimes the pain is so great, it doesn't matter that you're going to get better. What matters is that it hurts right now. But there is a plan there. See, with Job, we see an example of this where Job suffered incredibly. But do you know why? When Job proceeds to talk about, before Elihu goes in on him, Job explodes at his friends, telling them why they're wrong, why he is right, and why God is wrong to punish him so much as God is punishing him. But the things he proceeds to list out as things that he longs for, he misses, that he yearns for, he doesn't talk about his family. He doesn't say he yearns for the, the lost children that he has, or uh, he talks about things like pe having people rise every time he walks into a room, people giving up the head of the table to him. He doesn't talk about the, the things that we would think of for someone to long for after they've lost them. He talks about things revolving around societal affirmation. The things that made him feel special. That people did. People opening doors for him. And the f irony of it is in Matthew 23... When Jesus talks about the things that the problems with the Pharisees, some of the things that Job is talking about match up with things that Jesus is criticizing the Pharisees for loving so much. There was something off with Job, and it wasn't seen. I mean, Help! most Christians miss it. We read the first chapter and think that's it. No, there was a problem in Job. There was a fault in him. And God needed more. And this was how it came to fruition. This is how it came to bear. That it was seen. That it was addressed. That it was spoken to. And that it was able to be redeemed. And I know that that seem, in retrospect, like we who suffer think that that seems inhumane or disgusting or whatever. But at the same time, we, uh, at the same time, we... In the end, we endure a lot of things. And the reason being is that sometimes that helps create something in us, that helps draw things out from us. And sometimes that's the only way. Because we are all those kids who can't be told that the burner is hot. We have to touch it first to really understand it. And as a result, that's how we learn not to touch the burner. 
or that's how we learn to look at ourselves. That's how we learn to see the thing that's really wrong inside. Sometimes suffering is the way. And obviously that's not always the case, but sometimes it is. And sometimes that's when your pride will come to, fr come to bear. And you'll have to see it for what it is. And that's the thing that's dividing you and God. Sometimes your selfishness, sometimes your ego, sometimes your self-righteousness, sometimes your thinking that you know better than God. You're putting yourself in that place, in God's place, comes to bear and is seen for what it is. Sometimes it's just that people made choices and it affected you because they were doing all those things. It's always important for us to lean on God because he will know the way and he will help us with this. If it's something that's in our souls, he'll bring it to bear. He'll show us. If it's something in, from the world around us, he'll tell you. Because there are a lot of times when I personally have had things where suffering has been involved and I ask myself, I ask him, God, what did I do? And it's hard to accept sometimes, but the answer is nothing. You were fine. They made decisions. But, but how do I feel? But why do I have to suffer? Because they made decisions that made you suffer. It wasn't you. There was nothing wrong with you. It was them. And they decided, and they hurt you. And they're the ones that'll have to pay for that. In Psalm 121, or 112, it goes, Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright. For those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous, good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never shake, never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look and triumph on their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. The wicked will see and be vexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. In Psalms 114, when Israel came out of Egypt, Jacob from, Jacob from a people of foreign tongue, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled. The Jordan turned back. The mountains leaped like rams, the hills like lambs. Why was it sea that you fled? Why Jordan did you turn back? Why mountains did you leap like la rams, you hills like lambs? Tremble, earth, at the presence of the Lord at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into, into a pool, the hard rock into springs of water. And the last thing that I have to share is out of Matthew. Matthew 5, 
where Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A lot of us understand the Beatitudes. Some people preach it as being like a second Ten Commandments spoken by Jesus, but that's not even remotely true. This is a series of statements about people in circumstances that are good and bad, and how despite how bad or good they might be, they are blessed because God will be with them, and he will ensure that they are made well in the end. We struggle through a lot in this life, and we will struggle through more. But it is in our end that we find salvation, that we find hope, that we find joy. As we draw close to God, as we know Him, it is in His midst. We, the sheep in His flock, we, the, the chicks underneath His wings, protected by Him. There will come times when we will suffer, and it will be hard. And that will be a part of life, always and forever, because that is the life that we have, the world created by us being gods, or wanting to be. We will create circumstances where we will suffer. We'll, sh we'll ensure it. But in the midst of God, we will find safety and protection and hope and love. And those are things that can help us bear through all of this. I want you to know that he is with you and that he wants to be with you. And though he has not always seemed to be present, he is, and will always be. No amount of suffering will change that. And if you lean on him, he will provide you rest and comfort and a way out. But you must see him, you must be clear with him. We're not always that. That is hard sometimes. And that's okay too. Because even though you may sin in your affliction, His grace is over us. And He'll be waiting for you to turn from it, to come back to Him. Because He is always with you. And he always wants you. And even though you may not feel it or want it, he will always want you. That's a promise and a truth. And that's all I got.